Good afternoon and good morning and even good evening, depending on where you are in this beautiful world. Uh, we welcome all of you to our conversation, our conversation on achievements of and challenges for the United Nations, the United Nations at 75. As you well know, uh, on the 24th of October 20. 20, the United Nations will exist for 75 years. And that brings up a couple of questions, of course, questions of performance, questions of its status in the world today, but also if we look at the long time achievements of the United Nations, what is to be said in favor and what can be said perhaps in favor of changes or reforms of the United Nations. Has the UN actually done a good job in spite of many setbacks? It is a great pleasure that uh, we can welcome today uh, not only all of you who are listening now to this conversation, but obviously also our speakers who followed the invitation of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies here at the University of Leuven. The speakers of today are very profiled, high-level speakers, and I'm very happy that they are with us to share their insights on the United Nations at this special occasion, at this special birthday, uh, which the United Nations will be celebrating in two days from now. Uh, on the one hand, we have Dr. Francesca Spatolisano, uh, Dr. Spatolisano has uh, 35 years of experience in public service, including extensive senior leadership in multilateral affairs. She has served as the European Union ambassador to the OECD and UNESCO, Monaco and Andorra. She was a member of the EU delegation to the United Nations, serving as the head of its economic and trade section. She also covered issues related to trade, development, environmental policy and the second committee and the ECOSOC and was also the key representative to the fifth committee. Since 2017, she has been responsible for international organizations and development dialogue with other donors in the Commission's Directorate General for Development Cooperation and in this capacity she has assured the EU presence and developed EU positions on developing policy in several international fora including the United Nations, the World Bank, and the IMF. Um, Dr. Spatulisano is the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, DESA at the United Nations today. Welcome, Dr. Spatulisano. And also we have uh, with us today um, Alexander Stutzman, the Special Advisor for UN 75 Strategy and Implementation to the United Nations General Assembly President. Um, Alexander Stutzman currently coordinates, as I just said, the follow-up that the President of the UN General Assembly is giving to the UN 75 Declaration and its recommendations, and I guess we will have ample of opportunity to talk about that, across the different policy spectrums with all relevant stakeholders and relying on both existing and new initiatives. Prior to his current appointment, he was the team leader for social, humanitarian and cultural issues in the office of the president of the 74th session of the General Assembly. And before joining the United Nations assignment, he was director for parliamentary committees in the field of external policies in the European Parliament in the European Union. Welcome, Alexander Stutzman, to our conversation today. And last but not least, I would like to introduce to you uh, Professor Jan Wouters, who is full professor of international law and international organizations, Jean Monnet Chair at Personam and Director of the Institute for International Law and the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, as well as President of the International Policy Council at KU Leuven, amongst many other visiting and adjunct professor assignments. He is teaching at Columbia University, Louis and the College of Europe. He is also the 
principal investigator and coordinator of the Horizon 2020 project Reconnect, which is also a co-host of this event, as well as a participant member of the GLOBE H 2020 project on challenges of global governance and the European Union, as well as the Jean Monnet Network EU Cross. So welcome also to you, Professor Jan Bartus. In fact, before we start with the uh, debate of this morning, I would like to also come back to some of the questions which the United Nations are facing these days. As I mentioned already, what is, so to speak, the long-term achievement? How can we, so to speak, weigh the plus and the negative aspects that we have experienced around the setup of the world's most important multilateral institution. Is it ready for the next 75 years? If you only think about it, 75 years seem to be such a long time, but it also passed in a generation, in two generations, so quickly. So many things have changed, so many new challenges have been added to the world, to global governance and solutions are needed for the problems which the world faces today. So how important is the new, so to speak, strategizing of the United Nations? How important is, for example, indeed, the UN 75 declaration of 21st of September 2020, which has been just made public and how are the sustainable development goals affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Can the United Nations, can its participant members hold on to the very important task to actually implement the sustainable development goals or given all the economic setback, given all the societal challenges that we are not only facing now, but probably awaiting for a couple of years to come? And does the UN manage to mainstream human rights in all of its activities, especially given the need for greater economic development, rapid growth that so many expect from the world these days? What will be happening to values? What will be happening to the principles under this very important challenge which we are currently facing. And last but not least, how are the many parts of the UN family interacting with each other and coordinating their policies? And that family, of course, like every family, is always also witnessing problems from within. What are these problems? What are the ways to overcome the problems that the UN family is currently facing? Lots of questions on the table. I'm pretty sure that all our almost 200 participants in this lecture today are also having many of these questions after we've heard the introductory speeches by all our panelists there will be ample of time to ask your questions in the questions part of the panel which you see on the right of your screen so please think about questions ask your questions but also identify yourself and your affiliation when you do so. Without further ado, I would like now to give the floor to Dr. Maria Francesca Spatulisan. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I would like, first of all, of course, uh, to thank the Levin Center for Global Governance Studies, uh, its director, Professor Jan Wouters, and you, Professor Rabe, our moderator, for giving me the opportunity to address this uh, uh, interesting and uh, big group of uh, uh, the webinar, uh, sharing thoughts uh, on multilateralism and the future of multilateralism. This is a very, very good question. Will the multilateral system survive the crisis we are observing? And uh, how, what will it look like? Uh, after. 
So what kind of crisis are we talking about? Of course, uh, there is uh, there is a, a very obvious health uh, uh, crisis which has had or had, will have for some time a socioeconomic impact. But I think we are thinking also more in depth to a crisis of trust, which is clearly there between citizens and their governments, or even uh, a difficulty uh, among governments who participate in these multilateral institutions to make decisions, as the system should do, uh, to address the global challenges uh, these organizations are, have been built to address in the first place. So let's look at the UN and how the UN system, as you rightly pointed, it's a it's a complex system. Various entities participate in the system, even though from outside the UN is one, inside it's made of many entities, uh, each one with his own value-added and uh, expertise. So how this UN system, which is so composite, responds to, uh, say, the, the emergencies we are facing? And uh, I would take first the good news. The, uh, um, fact that you all know that the Nobel uh, uh, Committee assigned the Peace Prize to the World Food Program only a week ago is the sign that something good comes from this uh, UN system. The emergency in this case is the uh, increasing number of people who go un hungry and this is the first time this number is increasing in 20 years so far the, the trend was the opposite the numbers of people in hunger was uh, uh, diminishing regularly unfortunately now we have observed that, that these numbers are going up millions of more people uh, are at risk of uh, real uh, severe uh, hunger and the the emergency uh, has been, uh, in fact, uh, faced by the means, the logistic and the, the strategic uh, uh, means of the World Food Programme in a way which moved the Nobel Committee to give it the Peace Prize. Why the Peace Prize? This is interesting, I think. Uh, because if you look at the motivation, you see that they link very clearly addressing the food emergency to building peace. And that is very relevant because one of the things we learn when we work inside the system and the UN, is that all uh, is linked. If you have a tension in a, a region and population are uh, at risk of, uh, uh, for instance, hunger or poverty, extreme poverty, uh, droughts, climate uh, hardship, they will probably uh, be unhappy and rightly so, and will. Uh, create a, a situation where if not addressed there will be tensions and peace will suffer as a consequence or they will move and create tension in neighboring countries and so on and so forth. If you have um, loss of biodiversity it is a problem related to yes the natural environment but probably will create also difficulties in agricultural production and therefore you have a, 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 an economic problem in the making and so on and so forth. So we learn these interconnections are very important and peace is the result of a lot of these uh, interconnections being addressed properly. Now, uh, for instance, uh, the UN system is um, preparing for next year to uh, hold, uh, the Secretary General has decided to uh, hold a, a food system summit the next year. And this is a way to address, indeed, these interconnected uh, problems that we have observed, uh, as I was mentioning, which integrate uh, several policy areas. Um, the food system is the important word, is system in this case, because as we know, there is enough food produced in the world. The problem is it doesn't reach the, the people where it's needed, when it's needed. So uh, global value chains, global uh, transport chains, all these systems need to be revised to be able to respond properly to the needs of people. So this is what the UN is about, basically. A system which tries to, gives, uh, to give answers to global issues. Now, is there a framework or we do this ad hoc, just reacting to the problem of the day? Hopefully we don't. 
react to the problem of the day. In fact, there is not only the charter of the UN, which is the basic uh, uh, charter uh, and system of values of reference, but there is also more recently uh, what is uh, commonly uh, seen as the framework for action for the UN in the area of sustainable development. And this is, of course, the Agenda 2030, which was adopted in 2015, uh, uh, as you know. And uh, the uh, agenda itself has 17 sustainable development goals, each one supported by a number of targets, which mean action is required to reach those goals. So this framework is what helps the system to, to work together towards common objectives. But it's not only the system, of course, which is engaged, it's the membership. And this is very important. The system doesn't work if the membership doesn't produce also actions according to the objectives. In the case of Agenda 2030, the novelty, if you want, is not only that it is so uh, broad, but also that uh, it applies, the engagement the, in that agenda apply to all members. It's not just something for the developing countries or for other seg segments of the membership, it's for all members in an equal way. If you think of gender equality or uh, decent uh, work or uh, climate, education, all these goals apply and should be pursued equally by all the members. Um, one last uh, uh, element I would like to bring is the response. The system, to, to address your question about how it works and if it works, the response of the UN system uh, gave in these few months of uh, the year 2020, where we uh, were faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, given we have this framework for action, uh, we are, of course, uh, members and institution alike, uh, working together in the last 10 years remaining to pursue these goals. But, but a pandemic of this nature and this magnitude arrived and, of course, we have uh, measured the, the impact of this uh, pandemic worldwide and we know that it will be even more difficult than before to attain these goals. Actually, we are not on track to, by the year 2030, attain all these goals. So one of the efforts that the Secretariat has done under the leadership of the Secretary General is to give a comprehensive response to this new element and how they did it through a series of analytical pieces which aligned all the facts, the best science, the best knowledge, and from this basis, uh, identified possible responses, options, recommendations for action, so that the membership is equipped with the tools to uh, act in a way to respond to the crisis. And uh, uh, we did this through a publication and now, a series of policy briefs, which came very fast in April, March, and so on. But then were uh, all uh, uh, summed up and, and put together in a, in a publication called Comprehensive Response to COVID-19, which you can find online and uh, was well received as it gives uh, this kind of uh, response to, uh, and support to member states, um, explaining by sectors of activity, by regions, geographical regions, cross-cutting topics, and so on and so forth, how one could address uh, uh, this uh, trouble we are in. Finally, let me add the consideration, government and the system cannot do this alone. The, the issues of a global society like the one we live in, especially now with digital transformation, and I won't open this chapter because it would be very long, but I think it's, it's a very relevant element. Uh, these challenges can only be addressed if there is also a network of other actors who are permitted to contribute to the goals. And these are actors in the civil society, the private sector, the foundations, and you can imagine academia, science, 
who can and should be part of this network. I think this is uh, indeed, if you think of UN at 75, what we need to explore to make this um, institutional setting we have, and which is very essential, I think, uh, still nowadays, uh, more updated, more responsive. But I will stop here and let Alex continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opening uh, statement. Uh, lots of interesting issues which you already mentioned, and we will certainly come back to them in the Q&A. Uh, and perhaps we can now indeed move to um, uh, Alexander Stutzman, who has uh, also advised, in fact, uh, uh, on the uh, declaration um, which has just came out uh, for the um, uh, anniversary of the uh, United Nations. So we are looking forward to your to your insight knowledge, Alexander. Thank you, thank you very much, Kolya. Um, thank you, Jan, for the for the invitation. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to come back to the Catholic University of Leuven. When I was living in Belgium, it it was a regular habit to to visit you uh, in the classroom uh, or in seminars that you were organizing in Brussels. So I'm looking forward to these times to come back at some point, as I guess the students who follow us, uh, it's, uh, it's a much better way of interacting and socializing, but this is where we are. Um, it's a pleasure, nevertheless, to, to be with you. Just a quick disclaimer, um, obviously, as I guess is the case for uh, Maria Spator, Francesca Spatolisano before, I'm here in my individual capacity and very much eager to engage in academic debates, which allows a certain freedom of expression as well, but meaning that the views that I will share today are obviously my own, uh, drawn on uh, my uh, experience as a practitioner. Um, as I said, uh, and, and as you said, I mean, uh, in the past, I mean, Kolya, I used to speak a lot about the EU when I was coming to see you. Today, you asked me to speak about the UN. And while I was preparing to uh, what I will, t I will tell you now, I was actually thinking, hmm, there are a lot of mechanisms that are actually very, very similar, which means that those international organizations have actually much more in common then uh, very often seems to be the case. And indeed, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who is a European himself and who has been the President of the European Council when he was Prime Minister of Portugal, very much sees it that way and very often recalls, as he did again uh, during High Level Week this year, that the EU and the UN do share uh, the same DNA. Uh, and that will get us to a certain number of, uh, of issues uh, in a moment. So yes, I mean, uh, they do share the same DAN, that DNA, they have the people at their core. I mean, the chart starts with we the people as the, I mean, as the fundamental text of, of the UN. And as such, uh, and we're just talking today, two days away from UN Day, the 24th of October, it's when the charter was actually entering into force. And uh, this has been then considered to be since then the UN Day. We're about to celebrate the 75th anniversary um, with some celebrations in the GA Hall in person in New York, which uh, we a few weeks ago didn't necessarily see as going to happen as such because the situation of the pandemic was extremely critical here in New York. However, um, what was meant to be a celebration when it was conceived last year will in a way still be uh, a celebration, but at a time of very difficult um, challenges for multilateralism. As uh, uh, Maria Francesca has pointed out, I mean, never uh, more than ever before our, today we do observe, I mean, the uh, escalating climate emergency, uh, which is doubled by uh, biodiversity challenge, which is getting more and more obvious with the pandemic. Uh, there was a special summit on this during High Level Week three weeks ago, and this is meant to be one of the leading themes of the 75th session, very clearly, so together with climate. Obviously, also the rising geopolitical tensions. We said it before, the UN is an organization that was created to preserve and promote and uh, facilitate peace. This is still very much at the core of its mission. 
uh, even if the mission has diversified considerably since its inception, but that remains the fundamental bottom line, just as it is for the European Union, in a way. Um, if we look today at what's going on in the South Caucasus, but also the protracted and paralyzed conflicts that have been paralyzing the Security Council, I'm sure Jan will tell something about that, whether this is in Libya, whether this is in Syria, has also shown how difficult it is for the organization to respond adequately to this. But also, um, on top of all this, the grave damage caused by the pandemic, which uh, exacerbates not only, I mean, the health dimension of it, uh, as tragic as it is, but it exacerbates what was already present very much in the world before, disparities, inequalities, and of course, the fragility of the most vulnerable. One of the motto of the UN is no, not to leave anyone behind. Uh, the pandemic has shown that this is more than ever uh, the line to, to be followed. So a multilateral system in crisis, I mean, we all know about national interests, just look at the race for the vaccine these days, that doesn't necessarily say its name, but there is always this kind of tendency to, to, to play solo, to, to play national, and however, it gets clearer and clearer to everyone that this is not the solution. So at the same time, you have those tendencies to still go alone and be more efficient. All members see that actually collective action is required more than ever because the challenge is just too big to be faced alone. So a uh, crisis period, but a solid recommitment and firm recommitment to the principles of the Charter and actually, as we're speaking today in the General Assembly, there will be a celebration for UN Day, but at the same time on display, and that was initiative by uh, the women ambassadors uh, to the UN, to basically have a solemn signature and recommitment to the principles and values of the UN Charter uh, by signing the preambula uh, of the Charter in six languages on a giant poster. It's a very symbolic gesture, but it shows that at a time of crisis, there is this need to come back to fundamentals and to recommit to what, what actually brings us uh, together. So more than ever before, when it's actually hard, uh, notwithstanding the tension between national strategies, it seems that collective action um, is determined uh, to prevail. So in a way, a dialectic moment, a chance for the UN to deliver, uh, to show, as uh, Maria Francesca said before, that the system is actually coherent, is fit for purpose, and can provide the tools. Obviously, the system cannot do everything itself. Uh, the system is there to facilitate collective action by member states. Uh, and that is the task of the system. It cannot fail on this, but the system can only be efficient if it's efficiently empowered by member states to do so. And here again, a very strong parallel to, to the European Union. Um, so it is a chance for the UN to deliver. Some uh, even say it is a chance for the UN to avoid the risk of getting irrelevant because this has been uh, something which uh, has been uh, lingering for quite some years that actually the UN is not there any longer to bring an answer. Do we really still need a UN? Which brings, of course, the question of what would a world without the UN be? And uh, have we ever considered the cost of non-UN? It's extremely easy to criticize, but let's face it, if it hadn't been there, would we be in this world today? Would we be as inefficient as we are sometimes? Would we be not even more inefficient to cope with world challenges? What I mean to say by this is when the pandemic hit, um, the UN was like any other international organization, uh, basically at the core of the, uh, of the hurricane. Uh, it was expected to respond uh, as quickly as possible, and it was just as hardly hit as anyone else. So you are in that ambiguity, how do you come up with solutions? The um, UN nevertheless managed to uh, keep business continuity alive during all those months from March to September. General Assembly adopted 68 resolutions and decisions in uh, those uh, five months, which uh, had to be done through new ways of working, new procedural ways had to be found, a very quick shift to virtual, which in a world of diplomats is a very difficult thing because a lot in diplomacy is achieved 
through contacts, through informal uh, negotiations. So suddenly, when uh, you're uh, confined the way we're actually doing our seminar this morning, this becomes uh, this becomes a challenge in itself. However, the high-level week, which took place as always in the uh, half of in the, in the second half of September, um, had to be completely virtual this time for the first time on the basis of pre-recorded statements. So you were, we were just wondering, what is this going to be? Will this have the same convening power of a buzzing uh, beehive that is the UN building for those two weeks where people, uh, world leaders come together, those who wouldn't talk to each other actually have to bump into each other in the corridors and this is how you can basically spontaneously sometimes uh, move towards solving of a solution. Uh, well, of course it was virtual this time, but it showed uh, one clear lesson, the convening, the immense convening power of the UN is intact. Everybody participated. Uh, we had actually more high level speeches and engagements than we had ever before. Uh, that also shows because, of course, it was easier for people to deliver a pre-recorded statement, but they did it. And, uh, and, and, and not only was there the general debate, but there were very significant uh, summits, the one on biodiversity I mentioned before, but also the one on Beijing Plus 25 and the whole gender issue, showing that there are clear topics where the UN is leading and where the UN has to continue being the leader uh, with, of course, member states following and other stakeholders as well, but is going to be the leader in the years to come. This is all motivated by a sense of urgency, by, uh, it's that, by this impressive need to act uh, for the sake of credibility, of course, but also for the sake of survival. So that's a very, it's a very clear wake up call, very clear awareness. Um, the world needs a strong UN articulated around the pillars that the three pillars that uh, are actually grounding the UN. Those pillars are interrelated. It's peace and security. It's the sustainable development pillar, which also includes climate change and the agenda 2030 that has been discussed just before. Um, but it's also the third pillar, which is a very thin pillar, which is human rights. And uh, I'm getting to, to this pillar in a second. So this is the, 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 the nexus at the core of the, uh, of the UN. Uh, the face is there. Now we need the, the action to, to follow. And the first uh, significant action was indeed the first text adopted during the 75th session, which was the political declaration of the 21st of September. It was facilitated for six months by uh, Qatar and Sweden as the co-facilitators of the 193 member states. Um, they had to, of course, like everyone else, shift their consultations into virtual. They nevertheless kept the calendar, managed to have a text approved by the General Assembly by consensus at the beginning of July. Um, it was a tough negotiations. We could see all the uh, balance of power that is within the General Assembly basically uh, applying to the negotiation of that text. It meant to be an ambitious text because it needed to touch upon everything. I mean, from all the issues of the policy spectrum. And you could see the clash between the giants, the US and China on one hand, on the language, even on, on what looks like innocent language of a shared vision for a common future. This is perceived as being a certain model of society, which is not necessarily shared by everyone. So words do count. And we'll see when we talk about human rights that this is pretty much the same. And the other big issue was climate change and how to tackle climate change with those who would normally be the allies of a climate change strategy, uh, fight, fighting strategy, the United States of America, were actually uh, getting themselves away from the Paris Agreement commitment and with the risk of blocking the text of the whole declaration. In the end, compromises were found as you would do in a political setting and the declaration was adopted. But it showed, as I say, the dynamics within the GA, um, which is a little bit, we often talk about the GA being the world parliament. Well, yes, because I mean, every member state is represented. It's big, it's 193 plus three, the three being observers, among which the European Union, the others being the Holy See and the state of Palestine. Um, however, these are diplomats, these are not politicians. Although the dynamics underlying are very political, it's a different way of doing politics in a way. I mean, parliamentarians are independent. Parliamentarians in a, 
in a, in, in a good democratic systems don't take their instructions from their foreign ministry. Uh, this is the case, of course, in the General Assembly, which, of course, twists the system a little bit when you talk about a world parliament. But you can see similar features to a parliament. I mean, there are two big groups. On the one hand, the G77 and China. On the other hand, the European Union and the like-minded, as we call them as European Union, uh, which is, of course, the uh, Japan, the United States in normal circumstances, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, but uh, also increasingly countries from Latin America and even from Africa or Asia that are actually recognizing, um, I mean, the universal values that the EU puts at its core uh, as also their core values. So uh, that brings me, you see, to the human rights issue, but this is a little bit the way this goes. So you often have those clashes between those groups and it's very clear in all the issues of the second committee on economic and social issues, for instance, uh, the dynamics in the Security Council and on peace and security are slightly different because there it's still the model of the Security Council and the P5 that is preserving. But there again, you can see that that kind of dichotomy. So um, the GA does, of course, adopt resolutions. It, it, it takes action, as they say, it does vote. But um, during the pandemic, of course, there, the working method had to change. We see a chance here to maybe what is traditionally a very conservative um, organization, the GA in its proceedings, uh, because of the pandemic, might have to rationalize some of its working methods. So there is a chance of what they call an efficient revitalization to take place. We'll see if that happens. The danger is that some of the issues would be sacrificed in such uh, in such a revitalization, which are the issues that are a little bit embarrassing for some member states. One of them is human rights. And I'll finish on that note. Uh, the human rights uh, concept, as I mean, as innocent as it sounds coming from the EU, uh, which is something which we would consider as being in the DNA of the United Nations. And indeed, the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it came three, yet three years later uh, than the Charter. The Charter isn't that much a text about human rights. The Charter is an international legal text, as good as it is, as valid as it still is today. Um, there has been a lot of developments in the field of human rights, which is not necessarily yet reflected there. So as uh, Maria Francesca said, there are other texts, there are other uh, refer reference documents that are actually need to be put more dynamically and more firmly to the forefront. And indeed, there's been a whole action going on lately. The Secretary General has issued a call to action on human rights, which means to mainstream human rights in all the policies of the UN, because it's imperfectly done so far. And this is, of course, a reaction also to criticism that has been coming from some member states, but also from the outside, from civil society, from other partners. And civil society's participation in the UN is actually critical. And we can get to this in the question part. It is not yet to the level as it is in other international organizations. Uh, and if the organization is meant to be one of the 21st century, there is a need to consider seriously the involvement uh, of, of civil society actors. Um, this is all reflected in the political declaration. And again, the fact that given the criticism towards this, the declaration was nevertheless adopted, shows that there is some kind of willingness, some kind of dyna dynamic uh, in motion. Um, as I said, I mean, ambiguous theme but still vibrant areas the high commissioner on human rights is doing a fantastic job with her theme whether this is in geneva or in new york um, of course all in all it comes i said the pillar is very thin she i mean michelle bachelet recalls it very often it's five percent i think i mean around that of the un budget so it's a very thin pillar compared to the other two pillars and the struggle is always a budget struggle if you want to asphyxiate a policy you just cut the money and this is the risk. We see that in the fifth committee that deals with budgetary issues every year when there are cuts being made of countries usually who are not necessarily seeing human rights promotion as their priority. Uh, this is where uh, le nerf de la guerre hits usually. So yeah, that brings me just to, um, to come to, to the conclusion. We said uh, that uh, the EU sees this as a strong, I mean, those, those issues and values as a strong, uh, strong pillar. I mean, uh, in its in its own way, but the EU is a strong pillar within the UN. 
uh, it is a cohesive group. Um, even the, sometimes the, the member states that can be most difficult in Brussels, there is a really solidarity uh, and, and getting together uh, at the UN uh, facing, uh, I mean, the common challenges. It's a block that counts, that is seen as an organized block, as a well-prepared block usually, proposing solutions as well. So it is a true partner for the United Nations, at the same time a pillar within the system. So of course also uh, the biggest donor together with the member states and um, it is a strong voice. So there is a credibility for the, for the EU. The challenge for the EU remains a, a further, a broader outreach also to those who don't necessarily yet see it the same way. So there is still uh, some, so, some work to be done uh, on that, but it does indeed manage to, to influence the, uh, the agenda. So, uh, as I said, I mean, uh, the system is at a crossroad. There is um, a chance for an opportunity for uh, some dialectic upheaval, uh, but it requires consistency in those political ambitions. Um, we see from the high level week that uh, this is there, that this awareness is there. Uh, it's encouraging. So I would say let's walk the talk as a system and as membership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander Sitzman, for your opening remarks. And uh, I, I, I took note of uh, quite a few issues that we can uh, bring back to the uh, discussion later on. It was quite interesting that you mentioned mainstreaming human rights into all the policies of the UN, of course, that rings a bell for the EU. We know that the EU has done that exercise as well um, over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see that the UN is, you were talking about similarities, uh, trying to do the same mainstreaming exercise now as well. But there were many other issues which I took note of. Um, and I should also say the first questions are coming in. Uh, so please add your questions to the list of questions which we will be tackling during the debate later on. Uh, as I mentioned before, last but not least, we have Professor Vautis with us, who will now give his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rauber, and it's a great pleasure to be here in this panel with uh, um, colleagues and friends. And it's, of course, a very special moment that we can celebrate 75 years of the United Nations eh? um, for people who really uh, care about the principles about the values on which the UN is based, it's a very important date. And so I would be inclined to say at multos anos for the United Nations, but of course we need some adaptations. And I would like to share with you three reflections that I am inclined to make, um, say starting from that beautiful declaration on the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations that four pager which um, has been adopted on the 21st of september and to be honest the very adoption of it is something which i, I consider to be a miracle in today's kind of international uh, context and given all uh, the circumstances but it's there and there is a lot of um, interesting stuff in that and i'm going to devote three reflections first of all i start with the end i start with one of the final paragraphs in that uh, UN at 75 declaration, in which the member states of the UN pledge to undertake reinvigorated global action, and I quote, and they uh, commit to show unprecedented political will and leadership um, to that extent. Now, that's, I think, something on which you could have a little bit of a reflection, the whole question of international leadership, because Let's face it, we are living in a very, very difficult international environment. The whole construction of the post-World War II international order and the shaping of global institutions, with some minor exceptions, I would say, has always been happening under American leadership. Let's face it, it was the Roosevelt and Truman administrations, which in the 1940s took the lead in designing the UN and the Bretton Woods institutions and a number of UN specialized agencies. And I recall that it was a visibly emotional President Harry Truman 
when signing the United Nations Charter in San Francisco on the 26th of June 1945, who emphasized that the UN Charter puts a special responsibility on powerful states to rein in their power and to use their power for the benefit of world peace. And let me just quickly quote him. He said, we all have to recognize, no matter how great our strength, that we must deny ourselves the license to do always as we please, end of quote. So Truman rightly argued that the United Nations Charter, which he signed on that very day, could only work if UN member states were determined to use it, right? And that, and I, I continue my quote from his uh, impassioned speech, if we fail to use it, we shall betray all those who have died so that we might meet here in freedom and safety to create it. If we seek to use the charter selfishly for the advantage of only one nation or a small group of nations, we shall be equally guilty of that betrayal." End of quote. Why am I giving this long quote? Because, you know, to be honest, it's very refreshing. I think that uh, uh, it is language which we are not used anymore from a United States president. If I may say so, on the contrary, in the address that he gave to the UN General Assembly in September 2019, the current US president emphasized, and I quote, that the future does not belong to globalists, the future belongs to patriots. And the year before, in 2018, the same US president had assured the General Assembly, and I quote again, that the United States would never surrender America's sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy, and that responsible nations must defend against threats to sovereignty from global governance, end of quote. Now, so that's quite something, the contrast between those two uh, quotations, but we have to face it. Under the present US administration, the United States has been increasingly withdrawing itself from international institutions and international agreements, and moreover refuses to take a leading role in the existing multilateral frameworks from the UN and the WTO to the G20. Ian Bremmer has rightly described the current COVID-19 crisis as the first global crisis without leadership, compared to the financial crisis in 2007 to 2008, when we saw a very strong G20 action, when we saw the US, the EU, and other international players fully involved. And so my, my issue here, my first reflection is actually, who can take over that international leadership role should the United States continue to disengage? Well, it is clear that right now China is quickly uh, trying to fill the vacuum. It has become the second financer and the second largest contributor of assist contributions, uh, also of UN peace operations. Uh, it is after the US, but quite before Japan and all European uh, countries. China is already counting four directors general at United Nations agencies and so on and so forth. But the big question is, and it's for reflection and debate, um, would a Chinese domination of the UN be desirable, especially from the viewpoint of the respect and the promotion of human rights and democracy, which are also firmly uh, reinstated in that UN at 75 uh, declaration. If I may, a very quick reflection on then whether the European Union could be that new form of, say, um, engagement and international leadership for the UN. Alexandra has very beautifully spoken about the EU as a cohesive group, as a pillar within the UN, as a bloc that counts. And it's true, of course, if you read the EU treaties, there is this beautiful quote from Article 21 of the Treaty on European Union, in which the uh, Union explicitly commits itself to promote multilateral solutions to common problems, in particular in the framework of the United Nations. But just think of it. Should China become really a very dominant power within the UN? And you see the influence mounting, not just in terms of positions and leadership, read texts of some Security Council resolutions. There is now active uh, China-based language, and that was 
partially also one of the reasons why in a number of recent cases the US has basically posed its veto right. Now, but a very dominant China in the UN, would that still see the United, the European Union uh, being fully committed to working together and finding uh, solutions in the context of the United Nations? I think the best we can hope for is that uh, Europe will indeed show itself some reinvigorated leadership within the UN and uh, the United uh, Nations system, if possible, with a number of like-minded democracies from other regions, which share the fundamental values and commitment to multilateralism uh, as the uh, EU does. But we have to face it. The EU is not that much of a, say, solid actor within the UN. Coordination between the 27 EU member states takes place in many important gremia, in particular the General Assembly, but that is not a really generalized practice. Our member states, I mean are of the European Union, are still very often pursuing individual national interests within United Nations organs, programs, funds and agencies. And let's face it, our 27 EU member states are very attached to their own institutional position, privileges and seats at the UN and at each of the UN bodies. To be very honest, the UN continues to be a club of and still for nation states, which by itself complicates a serious role for the European Union as a unique regional organization. But that brings me to another point, if you still allow me, Mr. Chairman, because you have to watch the time. Huh? Um, the UN at 75 declaration identifies 12 areas that need to be addressed through this reinvigorated multilateralism. And very interestingly, the Secretary General has been asked to develop proposals by September of next year. It's called Our Common Agenda. And according to the Secretary General, as already indicated also by um, Dr. Spatolizano, um, in the context of COVID-19, according to the Secretary General, we have a so-called generational opportunity to build back a more equal and sustainable world. And the Secretary General is in that sense calling for, at the domestic level, some kind of new social contract within societies, but he's also calling for improved global governance and greater solidarity, uh, especially with young people and the future generations. Now, one part of the thinking of the Secretary General is that in order to be more effective, multilateralism needs to become more inclusive. And that's of course a very important message for the UN. It should not just be about and for and by governments, but also other stakeholders. Think of private sector, civil society. Uh, Alexandra was speaking about civil society engagement that it could still be improved. But also think about local governance, cities think about parliamentarians, think about academia even. Oh my goodness, academia, why? Now, so the UN at 75 declaration indeed speaks of boosting partnerships, mentioning all these actors, including regional and sub-regional uh, organizations, mentioning also about uh, that it will listen to and work with youth. But how can we get there? And there, to be very honest and frank, the United Nations firmly remains an intergovernmental organization without much of a proper democratic legitimation of its own. To be honest, at that point, the EU is very different with a directly elected European Parliament. The We the Peoples in the beautiful preamble of the United Nations Charter, if you continue to read the Charter, quickly becomes we, the national governments, in the actual binding provisions of the Charter. So the preambular language, which international treaty lawyers say is not as such a binding part of a treaty, but is context, okay, that actually is quickly replaced by basically an organization where all the tools are in the hands of um, the member states. So that, that I think is an enormous challenge because the member states will probably not let the Secretary General change the UN into a multi-stakeholder organization. In the end, it's them 
who are the member states, who have the voting rights, who provide the budget, and so on and so forth. So that will be a difficult exercise after all. Thirdly, and that's my last reflection, the Secretary General, uh, in, as part of his efforts for, uh, say, his report by next year, would also like to give multilateralism itself more teeth. And he's thinking in that respect in terms of the power to make and enforce binding decisions, or at the, at the very least, put more pressure on those member states who don't agree and who don't live by agreed norms and actions. And here too, it's a very daunting challenge to reflect upon. Um, give multilateralism more teeth. First of all, we know that we are in an unprecedented crisis of multilateralism, which I think requires a deeper analysis what has happened, not just with the UN, eh? you see it at the WTO, you see it at other global and regional organizations, even with the informal clubs like the G20, the G7, and so on. So we have to analyze a bit the deeper causes for the current crisis of multilateralism. But if you think about it, when the Secretary General calls for more binding decisions and the enforcement thereof, it goes a little bit against the mood of the current times, now that states are less and less inclined to commit themselves through binding legal instruments, to binding treaties. And there is a lot of soft law, and the UN is particularly good at creating soft law and very important soft law, eh? from the Global Compact on Migration to the SDGs to many other um, uh, important international standards. It's very valuable, and I wouldn't like to touch on that. But the idea that you can start making that more binding and uh, enforceable is a difficult idea. Um, and let me also recall that there is already for 75 years a United Nations principal organ that has the power to make binding decisions and to enforce them. That's the Security Council, especially when acting under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. And here I touch, and that's more or less my final uh, uh, point here, the Security Council, of course, is a whole chapter in and of itself, but we all know that until today, it continues to be hampered in its functioning by the veto right. Look at the practice of member states when it is about draft resolutions on Syria or even a draft resolution uh, based upon the call of the Secretary General to have a ceasefire. I mean, that too suffered in May of a, of a United States uh, veto. So there is the veto right. There is the non-representative character of the five permanent members today. Maybe it was different in 1945, but we live in 2020. And there is this rather, let's say, uncomfortable um, awareness that de facto, because the Security Council is so politicized and again very polarized, the permanent members enjoy de facto some kind of impunity for violations of the Charter and or other uh, rules of international law. And I think that's simply not sustainable. So, I mean, to be honest, we know that uh, reform plans for the Security Council have been going on for at least uh, 25 to 30 years. Nothing has come out of it. It is extraordinarily uh, difficult, but we really have to make an effort there. And I think, to be honest, that the European Union should finally get its act together on this precise point, the governance of the global collective security system, the Security Council. Um, if the Security Council cannot be reformed, the whole question is how do you enforce better international standards, as the Secretary General has been saying, you then quickly come in second best solutions. One of those second best is what we have seen when the Security Council is blocked, that particular countries, the US, the EU, others, adopt non-United Nations-based sanctions, restrictive measures in the terminology of the European Union. The question is whether that also not has its own big problems and legitimacy issues to be further discussed. The second thing, which I think continues to have potential and which we have been seen functioning in a way within the Human Rights Council since its uh, um, creation in 2006, are forms of peer um, uh, pressure and peer review, such as the uni Universal Periodic uh, Review in the Human Rights Council. Again, to be critically evaluated because not tout, tout n'est pas pour le mieux, uh, to say the very least there, but apparently 
those um, peer review based systems nowadays have at least a little bit more appeal to countries and they are less inclined to simply drop out of it. But again, I'm not saying this is a, a miraculous solution. We have to explore all these issues and I sincerely hope that by October of next year, we will have seen a wonderful report of the Secretary General that will have been unanimously endorsed by the UN membership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Vautis, for your, um, if I can say so, more um, questions and discussion points uh, rather than um, introductory uh, points. So thank you very much for your critical remarks. Um, and I think, you know, you raised a lot of questions. We should come back to them. I, if I have to structure, so to speak, the moderation right now, I would uh, think that uh, I take um, a couple of issues with me into our Q&A round, which strike me as being very important. Uh, they have been identified before by some academics as what you will perhaps want to call global governance gaps. Um, uh, especially by uh, Ramesh Thakur and um, uh, Thomas Wees. And the, the, the way how they looked at these uh, global governance gaps was basically to look into, well, what are, how can we explain global governance gaps? How can we explain that certain solutions to the pending issues, which ask for solutions globally, cannot, so to speak, be delivered and they pointed to, for example, uh, institutional questions which are obviously related to institutional reform but also to some of the questions of who, for example, takes leadership, who actually understands that a certain issue should be put, should be put on the agenda in the first place, should be discussed and should also be carried all the way through the institutional setup of the United Nations towards implementation. Another issue that global governance gaps identify is in fact knowledge and also the acceptance of knowledge, of truth, if you like, these days, right? Uh, what is actually truth and what do we consider, so to speak, the starting point uh, for uh, global governance to actually kick in for the United Nations to deliver uh, and the gaps between uh, different actors that come from different positions on what is truth and what is actually something worth uh, working on uh, seem to be diverging quite substantially. Another issue then is related to the question of the actual uh, global governance policies. What are the issues that we actually want to prioritize? Uh, what is the priority list, so to speak? The, the UN, as we know, has been putting a great emphasis on sustainability throughout the last years. But now, as also Alexander Stutzman mentioned, uh, there are different pillars. How do we prioritize pillars over each other? The budget may be an indication we heard already to do that. These are some of the things, and I'm saying that because there are lots of questions now which are coming your way, which speak towards these questions which are related to leadership, which are related to institutions, which are related to actors and policies. So let us give it a try to actually make sense of all the questions which we have seen. We may not take all of them at the same time and go through different rounds. What I identify uh, right now already in our uh, questions is uh, the um, need to answer a, quest, a couple of questions on the uh, role of the, let's say, constitutional setup, of the institutional setup of the United Nations. Um, and here, obviously, one question is a recurrent question, actually, over the last, if I may say, two, if not even three decades, that's the question of how do you see the reform of the Security Council going on? So something that Professor Vautis has already mentioned in his remarks, can it be reformed, is Anja Popovic asking. Another question around that topic is a question um, from, um, the, uh, from the perspective of actually uh, the reform and to which degree the permanent um, members in the UN Security Council have been 
pushing or rather blocking a United Nations reform. Uh, Daniel Schaubach is uh, mentioning reportedly the uh, five Ps have blocked any review of the UN Charter, even through Charter Article 109, Paragraph C, called for a review conference by 1955. This anti-constitutional attitude runs counter any major UN reform. What about, for example, UN democracy deficit? And then he goes into a question that I think, but everybody can pick that on, uh, especially Alexander Stutzman, what may want to pick up, would a UN parliament instituted by a two-third resolution of the General Assembly eventually lead to much needed efforts to effectively address urgent global problems such as pandemics, inequalities and SDGs and conflict resolution. So basically the big question, where is actually the UN parliament, right? You were questioning whether the General Assembly is one. Here is the question, can the UN actually have a real parliament? And uh, another question, uh, perhaps then, because I think it is somewhat related to what we already heard on the constitutional issues, is the uh, question of leadership. Uh, in fact, uh, the leadership question is one um, uh, that Bariki Mzawaka uh, has asked, and um, uh, Bariki is asking, is it bad for China? Is it actually bad for China to be a new leading nation in the UN's undertakings? In that sense, you know, somehow reversing, so to speak, the um, angle and asking, well, what's actually in for China to take the lead? Uh, would it not perhaps be um, also um, a rather negative effect for China to take on a leading role in the United Nations. And in fact, it's an interesting question if you think about China's attempts to build, so to speak, counter multilateral structures, uh, perhaps in a more regional format, um, but quite with a, with a global reach. If you look at the Asian um, Investment and Infrastructure Bank, this is, of course, an example that is often brought up, but we have to think about rather perhaps also China's ambitions outside the UN, outside the UN family. Um, and then uh, I will come to a very last question because I think uh, it's, a, it's a question that is actually specifically, um, uh, specifically, uh, uh, what can I say, um, challenging um, by Ignaz von den Steen. And Ignaz is actually asking, when addressing the point of Professor Wouters, if it would be desirable for China to be the dominant player in the UN in the light of human rights, can't we make a strong case that the US also is a big violator of human rights and humanitarian treaties, and thus not an ideal actor to be in the lead for the United Nations? Why would you think that China would be that different when becoming a dominant player within the UN? Uh, I have many other questions for now, but I leave you with this first set of questions on, let's say, institutional reform and leadership before we turn to other ones. Um, may I ask perhaps uh, uh, Professor Wouters to take the floor first so that we go in the reverse order? I will do that, um, although on a couple of points I have already spoken out in the meantime. Eh? So. Uh, can the Security Council be reformed? My goodness, don't expect a yes or a no um, answer from me because it, it could be reformed if we really um, are able to muster a unique form of consensus at global level. And of course, among the um, existing five permanent members of the Security Council. And to be honest, I think that's always possible. There are pessimists who say, no, this cannot work, and only a third world war can bring the world's kind of consensus together or something like that. I think that's not proven. Um, international institutions can reform, um, even if it is extremely difficult. I think there is always need for a, a sober analysis. 
for a number of alternative um, plans. Eh? Remember, once upon a time in, in March 2005, we had the uh, Enlarger Freedom Report of Secretary General Kofi Annan, in which he basically took over the uh, proposals developed by the high-level panel on, on future and threats uh, of December 2004, in which you had basically two scenarios for a reform of the Security Council, Plan A and Plan B, so to say. Plan A basically providing for uh, um, a certain um, extension of the number of permanent seats, uh, whereas Plan B was actually uh, the idea of quasi-permanent uh, memberships, not really um, creating new fully uh, permanent members, but basically making sure that a number of important countries could be quickly re-elected in order to be much more often on the Security Council. The Security Council, besides, is a place to take responsibility. It's not a place for exercising privileges and benefits and, and uh, international visibility. It is really a place where countries uh, should be held accountable for the responsibility and the engagement uh, that they take. And let's not forget the original thinking of the Roosevelt and Truman administration that the Security Council really had to consist of the world's fire brigade, right? Uh, if there are really conflicts, threats to the peace, breaches of the peace, new forms of, let's say, um, dangers to peace, and that goes from terrorism to, uh, say, failed states, to um, uh, issues that are also mentioned in the UN at 75 declaration, such as possible uh, uh, space and outer space um, uh, uh, and, and, and cyberspace uh, attacks. Um, these things have to be tackled, but I think one has to do some fresh thinking about the format in which um, the Security Council can really uh, do that. So I would say it, it, they should try it. And um, the rest of the international community should maybe also put some pressure on the permanent members to say, we expect something from you as well. And may, maybe even put some kind of timing on that, although that may be totally unrealistic. You see, I'm after all just an academic. On democracy, I've mentioned that because I really think that, to be honest, there is, there is a serious democracy legitimacy problem in the UN. Um, it's all too cheap, of course, to say that the majority of member states are not full uh, democracies and so on. The UN was also never conceived of as a club of democracies. But the question is, after all, how can the functioning of the UN itself be subject to um, a better form of democratic accountability? And you can again look at that also at the domestic level eh? or in Europe, as we have seen with so-called interparliamentary structures, combinations, of national uh, parliamentarians in some kind of interparliamentary club. And one of those interparliamentary clubs already exists for more than 100 years. That's, of course, the Universal uh, Parliamentary Union, um, the International Par Parliamentary Union. And, and so <laughs> it's interesting to, to reflect a little bit upon the value of that uh, union compared to the beautiful but maybe not very um, practicable uh, ideas for a United Nations uh, Parliament. Um, there has been a lot of thinking about the UN Parliament, but um, it would be interesting to organize a little event in which we, in a way, confront those ideas with, um, say, the, the frank uh, reactions from people in the government and especially from the diplomatic community, which is, after all, the first professional a community that has to work and has to book results within the United Nations. Then last but not least, um, about China and the United States as leading nations. Why should China engage? Because China, uh, I would say, it's part of um, an aspirational soft power type of attractiveness that you say we are pro-international harmony and cooperation and that we want to engage and that we are open and not closed and so on and so forth. So it's good for Chinese publicity and after all, for the popularity of China in the world. Let's face it, there are quite a number of countries who are afraid of China. Look also at the ongoing tensions around the Southeast Sea and so on. Then the United States has of course never been a perfect example of, of international leadership. Um, you see it from the very early days of the UN onwards, after the adoption of the Universal Declaration in a way, since um, the 1950s, that there has been a 
a big discussion in the US about the attitude to the UN and especially the question of international promotion of human rights, which was not a priority at a certain moment anymore, basically because of Cold War imperatives and also a little bit the fear, and we should face that, the fear in the US in the 1950s that this whole debate about human rights and you know um, equality and so on at the UN level would come too quick to also change the whole problem of, uh, let's say, the racial uh, uh, divisions and civil liber liberties in the United States itself. That's another important issue to take into account, the connectedness between global issues and a global agenda and a national domestic agenda, which is not always totally compatible with those uh, global uh, agendas. So the US has definitely never been a perfect uh, leader and a perfect uh, human rights um, or even democracy champion. But to be honest, we've gone a long way uh, in the post uh, Second World War international order, where the United States was, after all, uh, a stabilizing type of force. And where, depending on the administrations, the commitment to international cooperation and even to multilateralism was at times much higher than it is uh, today. So, yes, I'm looking for a replacement. Would be nice to. To, to, to think further of other candidates for that. I'm now going to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alexander. Thank you, Kolya. I think uh, Jan did give a certain number of answers to the, to the question. And, uh, and uh, when, when he was wondering uh, before why academia should be brought into the game, I think he just showed that, uh, he just gave the perfect example of why actually we need the academics uh, to speak very openly, very frankly, uh, with, with, with all the freedom he just showed. Uh, I'm going to try just to complement, uh, from my point of view, uh, some of the answers uh, that he that he has brought to the front. Um, uh, starting with the uh, with the U.S. not being perfect, and I mean, uh, being in the U.S. now for a little bit more than a year, I think, there's, especially in a country which is uh, currently in an electoral process that is, I mean, every American election is important, but this one is said to be even more important. Uh, than the others, uh, not necessarily to change the system from day one to day to day two, but uh, many see this as an opportunity maybe to reverse the trend of the current way the system is changing. And uh, I fully agree with Jan, the fact that the US isn't perfect and probably the mismatch between the global agenda and the domestic agenda is indeed one of those uh, parameters that, um, that influences that imperfectness. But we also see, and uh, he quoted Trump, and I think the comparison uh, with uh, his predecessors, uh, and we don't have even to go as back far as back as uh, 1945. I think if we even go to George Bush, W. Bush, or I mean, I'm not talking about Obama because that sounds a little bit more obvious, but just let's go back as to, as to Bush, we would see a terrible contrast. And the fact that uh, the US change, of course, has been so disruptive um, in the global system shows that even an imperfect leader is better than no leader at all. So in a way, uh, what we're calling here for is uh, the most possible perfect leadership. But um, first of all, it has to be it has to be leadership. So uh, it would be it would be denial to say that uh, somehow there's a pause here going on now for another two weeks. Uh, there's a lot of uh, expectations and uh, somehow apprehension as well to see what's going to come out on the 3rd of November in the United States because it will have an impact of, uh, on the future of the global system. It will have a clear impact on engagement or disengagement from that responsibility that uh, Professor Bautis was talking about uh, of what is still the first world power. And, uh, and you can see that some big uh, powers uh, or big players in the UN uh, have clearly shown where their preference lies of who would win the uh, American elections. Uh, China on the one hand, Russia on the other. So, um, so I think this is, this is something that, where we should have some sort of an answer very soon. That brings me to the, to the issue of China, which um, 
as imperfect as the US is, uh, and even if there are breaches of human rights in the US, there is a counter reaction going on, either from the judicial system or the mobilization of the streets. We saw it with the Black Matters movement. Um, when this happens in China, I think the latest was Tiananmen. We saw how that ended. So I think I wouldn't compare. I think we should still compare what is comparable. Um, however, this being said, um, China is, uh, as Jan was explaining, indeed very skillful. There is a UN agenda, but there's also an agenda outside of the UN. And um, you know, chapeau. I mean, they're doing it. Uh, they're doing it, and if I just may come back to the example of how the uh, UN Charter, the political declaration, was negotiated, um, I, I was explaining before that there has been some clashes between those main key players, uh, which in the system, the procedural system, how a UN text is negotiated led to what we call breaking the silence because it always has to be done by consensus. So somebody has to go against the consensus. Well, in the last stretch of the negotiation of the Charter, we had two breaking the silence. Uh, surprisingly, when you look at the text of the Charter today, uh, of the Charter, sorry, of the Declaration today, it is probably the best. I mean, this could be a text that could have been negotiated almost within the European Union, all right? So you would expect a very authoritarian regime to break silence on this. Twice silence was broken by the United States of America. It's never been broken by China, okay? But China was in the background making sure that uh, some of the issues that they would not want in the text or that they managed to get into the text at the very early stage, and here again, very skillful, they would maneuver from the background, but they would not show as being the ones uh, that have been actually responsible for uh, the failure of adopting a text. So I think that's an interesting way. And, and we see that this is a way uh, that uh, China is using a lot in uh, it, the way it currently operates within the UN system, uh, basically using the system and its uh, shortcomings at its own advantage. Um, the UN Security Council reform, uh, well, if it were not a true thing, it would be a nice joke. Um, as we said, it's, uh, it's been going on for decades. Um, it hasn't shifted, it hasn't moved. Uh, I think Jan gave a lot of the explanations why it's actually not happening. Uh, it would, it's a little bit like, like other frozen issues uh, that we face in the world. We know exactly what the recipe would be for a solution. Uh, everybody is aware of what the recipe would be, but it wouldn't go without concessions. And it's just that uh, nobody is ready. Those who would have to make the concessions are not ready to make them. Now, is this going to be sustainable? Uh, probably not, because what we realize is that as powerful as the P5 are, um, they did not manage lately, I mean, on most of the issues to get an outcome. So once you have a body that is in total paralysis, is that body still relevant? Um, that might be where there is a need for a change. Once, I mean, the P5 still managed to rule but get an outcome, which has been the case for decades, there is a reason of not changing anything. But if it's the deadlock for everyone, is that still a system that is actually satisfactory for anyone? question. I mean, look how long it took uh, these last months to the Security Council to actually adopt a resolution on uh, that was promoted by the Secretary General and calling for a general ceasefire during the pandemic. Uh, it was painful. It was absolutely painful. And if we go back to the notion of responsibility that was uh, quoted here this morning, uh, we're really, really far away. So, it is a prestigious uh, file that is usually distributed to two co-facilitators at every session of the General Assembly who have to uh, start and continue the process of thinking what the reform could be and how it could be implemented, etc. Um, what we also observe, as prestigious as it is, um, there are not that many lining up in front of the door to get the file because they usually know that they're going to 
to spend a lot of time on trying to do something which has a big chance of not going anywhere. So again, reverse to my, the beginning of my answer. Last but not least, a UN parliament. Of course, having spent 20 years as a civil servant in a parliament, which is a rather unique kind of its own, which is the European parliament, uh, it is, of course, very tempting to say, yes, of course, the UN would need a parliament, especially if you if you look at uh, at the way the European Parliament has managed over the years, and especially in the last two decades, to become a key institutional player in the EU system. Just try to remember what the EU decision making was before there was a fully fledged parliament, before we had the Lisbon Treaty, but even some of the steps before that. Um, this has considerably changed the decision-making uh, process within the European Union. It has changed the access and uh, inclusiveness uh, to the EU decision-making. So you would expect that this could be potentially an answer to the shortcomings that have been pointed out uh, this morning of the UN system, whether it's its legitimacy, its democratic accountability, etc. The question remains, though, um, as Jan said, it's a club of member states. Uh, the EU has a supranational dimension, which makes it very clearly more than the sum of its parts. Uh, is the UN in practice, I'm not talking in theory, in practice more than the sum of its parts? I'm not really sure. Uh, it has the expertise, it has agencies that are doing a fantastic work but it remains a place ruled by member states. And uh, diplomats and parliamentarians are very uh, different species. Um, although the PGA, the president of the General Assembly this year, turns out to be both of them. He was a diplomat, an ambassador, Turkish ambassador to the EU, by the way, and as well a member of the Turkish parliament for the last 10 years. And you can see that there is more of a political approach in the way he is running the GA and also trying to have the GA as uh, acting really as a chamber that would also counterbalance uh, other bodies, including uh, the Security Council. Should we have a proper second chamber of the UN? I mean, the GA being a sort of a council, one vote, one member state, a Senate in a way. What would that House of Representatives of the UN look like? Who would vote for whom? Uh, who would be appointed? Honestly, it's not very clear, and also with the caveats that Jan has been saying about the, 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 state, the, 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 the state of the art of democracies around the world, it is a very Western concept to have a parliamentary assembly, whether this is consultative or effective uh, for, the, um, for, the, for, for, for the UN. So yes, it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's an interesting academic debate. Uh, whether this can be translated into reality, I have a certain number of doubts, and I really have doubts as well as the as to the IPU being able to play that role uh, for the exact same reasons of the composition of the IPU. Um, it nevertheless is an interesting uh, resonance chamber, and and the, the 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 thing, the way that should probably be uh, followed much uh, deeper is a major interaction of parliamentary actors into the UN system. That doesn't mean the creation of a new body, but that means a mainstreaming of parliamentary voices uh, together with other stakeholders into the UN system. There is an annual hearing of the IPU. Uh, the IPU has observer status in the General Assembly. There is an annual hearing on a specific topic chosen by both sides where parliamentarians gather for two days at the United Nations trying to feed, and successfully so, into the work of the of the UN, but that remains marginal in a way and could be mainstreamed much further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander Stutzman. And uh, uh, Dr. Spatolisano, I uh, received a couple of questions in the meantime, which I think are especially interesting also for you. So perhaps I can add them to your list uh, of, of, of questions. And the questions are actually uh, um, about uh, civil society actors. Uh, Wolfgang Papa is actually asking that question um, about how can the EU, how can, sorry, the UN legitimize the participation of civil society to make it accountable in decisions and in a slightly similar direction, um, but 
still more specific, Monique Nordemeyer is asking, how can the UN make big companies more responsible for revising global supply chains into fully sustainable chains? But what's the vision here of the United Nations? So perhaps we can add these two questions to your list and then I have a whole new list of questions um, once uh, we have been going through that first round. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for these questions. I would like to um, add a word or two on the previous batch of questions on UN reform and human rights and then go into these uh, two very interesting questions which you added. Uh, but uh, if you allow me, I, since very well, my colleagues Alex uh, and my colleague Alex and uh, the professor Walter have already spoken about the institutional uh, aspects. I would like to do um, to tackle these issues of UN reform uh, from a different angle, a little bit less systemic, maybe, but more on the uh, pragmatic side. What is doable with what we have? And we may have in the foreseeable future. Uh, as I was a trade practitioner, trade negotiator for many years, so let me draw an example from uh, those years uh, when I was uh, in the European Union uh, as uh, and, and negotiated uh, trade agreements in Geneva. And this was before the WTO, it was, imagine how long ago when the gap was still the place where you would negotiate the, the organization, which was just an agreement, in fact, not an organization before the WTO began. Now, what happened um, back then is that the European Commission was already negotiating uh, tariffs uh, with the rest of the world on behalf of the EU member states on a de facto basis. And this is very relevant. Why was it doing it on a de facto basis? because it was not a state, it could not be a member, a party to the agreement, but on the other hand, it was managing the external border of the European Union. That means that it had the technical tools to negotiate those agreements and member states found it useful to do it in a joint way through the European Commission in Geneva. What I'm trying to say by this example is that sometimes de facto situations precede and anticipate legal arrangements. If there is a real uh, functionality, if there is a real reason behind a certain arrangement, a certain situation to be addressed in a certain way, possibly it will then eventually translate into a legal text, but uh, there is. Um, I would say ground in many cases to first do it de facto, test the waters, um, provide solutions, and through this demonstrate the, the utility, the, the appropriateness, the effectiveness of a certain solution. So that is uh, an example which I think might apply in other contexts, including the UN, to a number of uh, policy areas or uh, issues which uh, could benefit from uh, a sort of testing period, the de facto solution for eventually become a, a true legal text. Um, another example in the human rights uh, uh, area. To exert your uh, rights, you have to legally exist as an individual. Legal identity is a premise of uh, being a subject of rights, human rights, other rights economic rights. Uh, who does uh, uh, promote the uh, subject of legal identities for all is indeed the UN in a very technical, obscure kind of work, but which is a fundamental premise to exert human rights and other rights, as I was saying. The statistical uh, the directorate of DESA does exactly that creates the standards, uh, promotes uh, uh, the establishment of regulation at country level, which allow a, a nation who doesn't have all the tools to produce and adopt those tools, which will 
reach out to the population in very remote areas or even in urban areas, but very um, demuni, as they say in French, and they were not uh, able to, to assert their rights because initially they didn't have a legal identity document to, to prove their identity. So these are things which are at the heart, if you want, of what uh, the UN can do in a very everyday, regular, pragmatic way, but which build at the basis on which you can build more uh, systemic results eventually. I couldn't agree more, now I changed subject about the European Parliament, couldn't agree more with what uh, Alex Anders-Stutzman said, no more bodies probably is a good uh, option. Uh, the problem with the UN is that there are too many already overlapping places where things get uh, discussed very often and too many actors uh, crowded in a certain uh, geopolitical area. And sometimes that is also a reason which uh, brings paralysis. And, and so I, I would plead for uh, rather going in the opposite direction, a, a sort of uh, uh, simplification would help to get to decision making more than the other way around. Um, civil society role. Uh, the, the, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs where, uh, where I serve is of course uh, uh, very much uh, in the, the hub of a number of stakeholders uh, relations and uh, we promote the presence uh, of the stakeholders in all the intergovernmental uh, uh, events which we support and the work of the committees and general assembly so for us this is part of our mandate to to be able to uh, listen and include the views of the stakeholders in particular uh, there was a question about big companies uh, you may or may not know that there is uh, something called the Global Compact, which is an entity in the UN system which exa does exactly that, uh, opens the, the doors, so to speak, of the UN to companies who subscribe to a set of principles which are about sustainability and decent jobs and these kind of things. So there are mechanisms there which are meant to include the voice to, to listen and also to push at the same time is a two-way street these companies to do good and therefore be partners in uh, in the un um i think that's all for now on my side thank you thank you very much uh, and i think we have already uh, obviously made uh, quite some effort to to answer all of the questions but i see, still have a couple of questions here in the in the q and a and what i would suggest now since uh, we are running um towards the end of our session uh, in about 20 minutes time that i uh, will um bring some questions to the table and then you can simply pick and choose uh, some of these questions um from your side uh, there is one question, uh, still a more institutional question, by Walter Kemps, who is basically asking whether it wouldn't make sense uh, to reach a more balanced permanent membership of the um, Security Council by, uh, for example, introducing regional representation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that has been discussed. And uh, regional representation, such as, for example, a regional representation of the EU, the AU and ASEAN, and if I may ask, perhaps from your personal point of view, uh, well, what 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 difference does it make that uh, the UK is no longer um, a, a part of the EU for the representation of the EU in the UN Security Council? I would be very interested in 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 seeing a little bit your reflection on this. Um, uh, another issue um, that is very uh, much so to speak, put forward by everybody, is the issue of sustainability, but also carbon emissions, and um, uh, the uh, question of how can we actually achieve these um, big, uh, so to speak, um, needed solutions to 
pending problems around um, sustainability and uh, climate change. There is, for example, uh, one um, uh, question by Niall O'Shaughnessy, who basically asked, well, shouldn't we accept that uh, China has now uh, put forward to become a carbon neutral country and should we not simply accept the leadership of China uh, uh, in this uh, field? Um, how uh, do you reflect on this? And perhaps a, a related question is uh, by Siki Sao from KU Leuven, um, what is the impact that the UN could have on China? So it's not only Chinese, um, so to speak, leadership, but also which impact could the UN have on domestic change, including um, carbon emissions uh, in um, China. So uh, if you like, the um, other side of the coin. And then De Lea uh, Coronado is asking, well, given that the SDGs are already um, uh, SDGs in, that run out, so to speak, should be achieved in 2030, we are already in 2021. If you think about it, shouldn't we think about reform? Should they be revisited? Uh, and uh, it, can you perhaps share some reflections on this? Um, is it really um, uh, a possibility to, uh, that is currently already discussed in the United Nations? Um, uh, Joshua Davis, probably also against the context of contestation, of multilateralism is asking um, about uh, UNESCO. Um, uh, another issue, um, uh, well, for the UN at 75, he's asking, what role and importance do you see for UNESCO um, meeting up upcoming challenges? It's a different field, obviously, a different policy um, angle, but uh, very important, obviously, given uh, the withdrawal. Um, and uh, then uh, a very broad question, but I think a very important question by Matthias Körpers, um, who is asking, well, if we look at all of that, if we look at the huge agenda, the huge ambitions that the UN has basically set out in so many declarations, in so many uh, different ways to actually achieve change on a global scale, um, is it perhaps that what concerns the UN most as a problem. It's over ambition. Um, if you face all the initiatives and plans, he says, for the future, it seems to be apparent that there needs to be some sort of realistic agenda. Um, perhaps you can reflect upon that. Um, I read into this perhaps also some sort of a functional approach, right? Um, uh, with what do you start? How do you prioritize? And should it perhaps rather come incrementally uh, over the next years rather than um, having a broad agenda? It's an open question that uh, Matthias Köpers is asking. And I think with that uh, round of questions, which are all questions rather on uh, policies and global um, solutions to pending problems, I would like to give the floor back to you. Perhaps. This time, we start again with Dr. Spatulisa. Oh, well, uh, there are very, very different questions in this group. Uh, and uh, um, is the UN over ambitious? Let's start with the, <laughs> the very challenging question. Um, I think the chart is uh, indeed very ambitious uh, because it wants to establish uh, uh, global peace and this is something never happened and yes we are in that respect over ambitious in the same way as the SDGs are extremely challenging because uh, a world where all the SDGs were to be reached would be the perfect ideal world now are we going oh, sorry for this are we going to be able to do that. Um, as I said before, the indicators we track say we are not uh, ready or we're not on track for, for that in 10 years. It would be uh, at this uh, pace very uh, unlikely that we uh, achieve those objectives. So the, the 
effort of uh, the membership and the system is to accelerate action to do so within the time frame. I think that if you read the literature, you will find that, that it's not a problem of resources. Money is there. It's not a problem of, as I was saying earlier, food production. There is enough to feed the world and so on and so forth. The problem is uh, often of political will and second of uh, ability to implement in a coordinated way some of these uh, uh, objectives. Some technology exists which would help us doing so and, and therefore uh, what we can say is that maybe it's ambitious but not necessarily over ambitious to, to be willing to aim for the best uh, what is uh, difficult is to bring together all the elements and make them contribute to, to, this, uh, to these plural uh, goals. Um, the UN, however, I should say, is not alone in striving for these goals. There are other actors which are equally important. The uh, IFIs, international financial institutions, multilateral banks, G20, and you can continue, all have a role to play, whether it is in the financial world or it is in the political sphere or at the regional or global level. So it's not that the UN has this sort of hubris of doing everything by itself. The UN is the place where every country can come and have one vote, and that is what makes it special, I think, still nowadays. Uh, because Samoa will speak as much as the United States and uh, in, in fact this is another example I could give you how it works. If uh, as uh, Alex was saying earlier uh, there are uh, groups which are established uh, on a regional basis uh, and which are the, the main actors in the UN dynamics, the G77 and uh, like-minded and uh, uh, and then there are subgroups uh, within these uh, two main groups. These dynamics, which are those which determine the outcomes of many uh, subjects, in fact can be and sometimes have been different and brought to results which were unexpected. And the best example is the Paris Agreement, the climate change. Um, one of the major elements of novelty there was that the group of SID, the small island developing states, found out by looking into the substance of the problem of climate change that their real interest, the survival interest, was not to resist uh, this agreement but to sit with those who were promoting it. And, uh, um, that made a totally different environment which brought uh, to a, a different majority in the end which pushed towards the adoption of the agreement. So what I'm trying to say is that one shouldn't uh, give up to suit because there are ambitious uh, goals but it, it's possible to, to work together to reach them. Um, UNESCO, what role? UNESCO is a very important uh, organization and uh, as its name uh, announces, it has a, a set of mandates in education, science and culture, which are uh, as important to, I think, uh, the people of the world as the economic uh, uh, sphere is, because uh, man doesn't live of uh, only economic uh, Success also needs education, indeed, culture, science. And the organization has a number of activities which are very well known, like the, the list of world heritage sites and the preservation and conservation of the sites. But it also has a, a task very relevant in the field of education, and we now know that it is uh, uh, fundamental that uh, those uh, services are not, uh, how to say, uh, abandoned even in, uh, in countries where the budget doesn't allow for, for uh, a lot of expenditures in social services. Uh, 
Uh, one thing that, so I think it's uh, completely relevant to our future uh, to, to keep maintain the organization and to keep using its uh, very skilled people. One thing I would like to note in this respect is that the uh, year 2021 is the International Year of Creative Enterprise, I think it is the official name, which means that uh, uh, there is a recognition that the um, creative sector is a very important economic sector, on, which includes uh, nowadays also digital technologies, uh, communication through a number of other channels, as well as the traditional art and, and creative uh, um, you know, activities. So I think we will see a lot of interesting things coming up next year to, to illustrate the contribution of creative uh, enterprise uh, to, to the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I give the floor to Alexander Stutzmann. Just pick and choose questions which you would like to comment upon. Okay, thank, thank you, Kolya, because there were many, many questions. I'm going to try to be very quick on uh, most of them. Uh, on the civil society, I think we've, we've talked about this and the legitimizing the participation of civil society. The fact that this is at the core of most of the debates we're having now, I see this as a positive sign. Maybe we haven't reached yet uh, what the ideal situation would be, but the fact that there's so much talking about it, uh, shows that it actually does matter. So let's believe in the performative function of language here, but uh, very often soft law uh, comes also from a lot of, of discussions. So uh, there, there, there are good prospects for that. Um, what, where the pros I think where the hurdles are is the issue of uh, a systematic access and status of civil society, which within the UN system isn't harmonized either. There's a very different conception of what that should be uh, in Geneva uh, or in New York, for instance, and then different regional groups have different understandings of the same, of the same terminology. But that is not new and doesn't only apply to uh, civil society actors. I think one, one aspect where the UN will have to work on is what is currently uh, the practice of the so-called non-objection procedure, which is that when a civil society organization, that, that can be academia, I mean, we're not talking about activists and NGOs only here, um, wishes to attend a UN event, uh, not even in terms of speaking at that event, but also just to attend it when it's a closed event, uh, there is a discretionary power of those uh, of the member states to accept or not to accept. And uh, it is a perverse system in itself because for the time being there is no accountability at all on this. Uh, a member state doesn't even have to unveil which member state can simply oppose on whatever basis. I think there uh, we really have a problem in terms of uh, legitimacy, not of the CS uh, of the of the of the CSO, uh, the civil society organization, but in terms of legitimacy of the opposition procedure by the member states. Uh, enough on that. Um, I would link this to the um, private sector big company, and I think we should look, and the UN should look at the triangle between UN civil society uh, actors in the sense of NGOs and. Uh, private sector companies. Um, just wanted to point out a great example uh, of a civil society organization, uh, which uh, is the World Benchmark Alliance that has been um, working over the last two years in setting benchmarks for the private sector in coping with the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and you can see that uh, the world organizations like the World Benchmark Alliance have become the best allies of the UN system that has the same shared interest in implementing and having everyone implement the Sustainable Development Goals. So you can have that sort of peer pressure generated, facilitated by civil society for the service of principles that have been put out there in norms by an organization, the UN, and there there is a great potential in that triangle between private sector, civil society, and the UN. That, of course, refers also partly to the answer uh, to my previous to the previous question um, on um, the huge agenda. Yes, there is a huge agenda. Uh, is the uh, UN over ambitious? I don't think so. I think it just has no choice. Uh, if you look at the uh, UN 75 survey and campaign that had been organized by the Secretary General and his special advisor Fabrizio Horschel on the matter, uh, which was gathering, collecting data, 
um, organizing dialogues uh, first in person and then virtual throughout the, the last to the 47th session, the 74th session, uh, what comes out of all those surveys is that people want more UN. So people want more UN, people expect the UN to answer more of the global challenges and more of the problems. Um, the, the problem is therefore more uh, how can the UN cope with all this? I mean, system-wide coherence is obviously an answer. Um, the answer of prior prioritizing, basically the UN is not necessarily good at doing everything and not everyone in the UN is good or best at doing everything. So that's maybe a challenge for the, which is a challenge the Secretary General and his teams are considering very clearly uh, on, 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 on this system-wide coherence, uh, also in the process that Jan has been alluding to, which is the implementation of the declaration and the model of governance uh, for, for the future. So, um, and I think the, the SDGs, we've been talking about them, uh, 17 of them, uh, not an ideal number by far, nobody never remembers 17, we remember 10, 20, 15, but 17 was an odd number, but that was the best of the synthesis they could come up with. But this was an effort to rationalize those ambitions into channels that can be tackled in a systematic way. And by the way, UNESCO is tackling some of those. I mean, education is one of the SDGs and it is at the core of the decade of action. So uh, agencies like UNESCO are clearly implementers of some of these SDGs. Um, I was a little bit puzzled by the question on the leadership of China in the field of carbon neutrality because China pledged for that. I think the EU pledged for that too and has kind of serious credentials of being uh, in the leadership for that. Uh, that brings me to say that the relationship to China and with China is not as clear cut and uh, as simple as it might sound. We don't only talk about human rights with China. I think we can also team up with China when our objectives do converge. That doesn't mean necessarily that one has to lead on the other. Uh, there can be extremely equal, equal cooperation also on the matter and the carbon neutrality might be, might be one of those areas. Last but not least, I would just like to say a word about the UK um, in the regional representation in the Security Council. Um, the EU has uh, currently an enhanced observer status in the United Nations, which means that it is somewhere between an observer and a member. Um, getting an EU seat in the Security Council under these legal conditions uh, is just totally unrealistic for the moment, but also because some of the member states who are already in don't necessarily see it that way. It is a campaign that has been pushed by those who would like to be permanent members of the Security Council, but know that they don't necessarily have a chance, but that some of the EU fellows might have a better chance than they do. So this has always been a, a little bit of the battle in, in the background. Uh, as to the UK, uh, yes, they left. Uh, yes, uh, the EU as such uh, lost a seat, a permanent seat in the Security Council. But luckily, I mean, when you compare how uh, the cooperation works with the UK in New York, and when you hear what's going on in the Brexit negotiations in Brussels, these are totally two different worlds. Um, the good news is that in New York, the UK and the EU and EU member states still play along very, very much uh, as to how they see and converge on, on the key issues, if not on almost every issue. So in a way, before or after Brexit, cooperation continues uh, in a very similar way, at least in global arenas like the UN. Thank you very much. And uh, I have to say, unfortunately, I, our time is already coming to an end, but Professor Wouters, you are uh, still to go. So perhaps you can turn your answers into some sort of a short concluding statement. Well, it's not going to be the conclusion générale du colloque, but I'd like to make simply two points here, having had a wonderful conversation, and we're really very grateful, not just for our two eminent speakers from New York, but also for the audience that has been very active. And I really would like to continue that um, discussion a little bit later. I have two points I would like to make about, uh, first of all, the question of Security Council reform and regional representation in the Security Council. It's not going to work through formal treaty change, it will not work. There is not going to be an EU seat, formally speaking, even if EU member states would agree on that, which is not the case. But what nothing prevents France 
from making its permanent seat a de facto European Union seat. In fact, before the Lisbon Treaty, as our colleagues will recall, the system was that uh, one member state in the General Assembly, the one having the rotating presidency, spoke up on behalf of the whole European Union and its member states. What would prevent France from doing that if they really wanted to play the European card? I think it would be a very interesting kind of new form of, uh, let's say, development in the Security Council. Mais ce n'est pas très réaliste. Okay, the second thing, uh, I heard um, <clears throat> uh, Alexandre and, and, and Maria Francesca speaking about um, people that want more United Nations. I'm actually wondering whether we should not explore a little bit more for ourselves in Europe, whether indeed the Europeans want more United Nations. I'm not entirely sure. I think many, many people will sympathize, but the problem is, first of all, the UN is not well known among the general population. That's one issue which I have encountered time and again uh, in my 13 years as president of the United Nations Association. Secondly, I think that also, unwillingly, the European integration process for many of our, say, um, people, but also the policy makers, has in a, in a way led to some kind of shrinking of the geographical horizon to the boundaries of Europe. What do I mean? I put it a little bit too harshly, but I think that in the public debate and even in academia, the, the broader analysis of global problems and of global multilateral institutions has in a certain way become in a way oppressed by the enormous attention that is being given also thanks to the help of EU research funding to European Union studies and European integration. So my advice here would be for us Europeans and for the European Union to actually uh, take a stronger look at the UN and at global developments, start strategizing more about it. And we know there is a geopolitical drive currently working in European institutions, but also very strongly towards our citizens, really try to convince them and cultivate an attitude that there is not just a European citizenship, that they should not just be chiefest Europeus, but also chiefest mundi, a real citizen of the world. We need that kind of global citizenship feeling also in Europe, because otherwise people will not even know or realize what the incredibly important role of the United Nations is to globe with all those challenges and to procure global public goods. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these uh, last uh, words. Uh, in fact, not concluding uh, marks, but uh, very important reminders of uh, opportunities, but also of challenges that we are facing in Europe and in the context of the United Nations. I cannot conclude either at this stage because our time is already up, but perhaps uh, we should indeed um, think about the ongoing dynamics. We should think about the critical junctures that the United Nations has been facing at its very start, but also uh, on the way. The question is, of course, whether what we are facing right now, the global pandemic, whether this is a critical juncture of a new sort uh, that in the way accelerates issues, accelerates challenges and problems, but perhaps also, as uh, a lot of people remind us, uh, creates opportunities uh, for further cooperation amongst those who are willing to actually see themselves as citizens of the world, as Professor Wouters has just been mentioning. So with that, I would like to already conclude. It seems that these two hours have flown by so quickly. Thanking uh, Dr. Spatolisano. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much. Alexander Stutzman, thank you very much, Professor Vouters, for giving us the chance to talk with you, to have this very fruitful conversation. All the best to you in New York. Have a really good day ahead of you. And uh, we will very soon close here the doors in our institutions and start the new day tomorrow. So thank you very much. And um, I should say thank you on behalf of everybody watching and listening to your very interesting comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kolya. Thank you, thank, thank you thank Jan. You. Thank you, Maria Francesca. And thank you, students, for the great questions and the good discussion. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.